Everybody hear me? Yeah, then, all right, so this introduction ain't like a standard introduction. I'm not going to give Dimitri's background too much, but I'll give something that I kind of know about him, and hopefully that'll be good for y'all. When I first saw Dimitri's name on one of the early Nemo threads sent out to all the MFA students, my first reaction was like, oh shit, we got a Russian dude in the program with a Latino last name? <laughs> A trail of follow-up questions started brewing my mind. Is he Cuban with Soviet sympathies? Were his folks just like mad into politics? Did they have it in with Castro? What year did they immigrate? Do they got crazy exile stories? Then I realized one time as we was riding the path train home as he pronounced arroz as a hoe, that he was Puerto Rican. I think I said something like, oh, yeah, that's cool. But news far greater than my own leftist fantasies about my peers is realizing the beauty that is Dimitri's poetic eye. Something that, given the fact that we were in different workshops last fall, I did not realize until recently. In this reading, you'll listen as to how it spans from satirical epics of Zeus visiting a slaughterhouse, to bug-shaped cat toys, to a caffeinated encounter at the Dunkin' Donuts, and beyond. But what takes me far than these horizons is just what a wonderful human being this man is. He doesn't know that every time he offers me a ride home after workshop or at a writer's and work reading, it's one of the highlights of my day. Or when he offered me a family-sized bag of knockoff looking charms, I ate them shits like in three days. <laughs> and I've been buying one a week ever since. <laughs> How our supermarket runs remind me that I do have family in this strange land called Noah Yes. But you don't have to know his brother too well to know his compassion. Whether it's those long emo blurbs of writing opportunities sent out to the MFA fam, his extensive years as a public school teacher, the candid stories about his trials with his family, with Dimitri, I always have a reinstilled faith in the goodness of people. He speaks with grace, always letting the others speak first. His sympathy extends from the two-legged and moves through animals, to which I imagine him saying, you anthropocentric ass, we're animals too. <laughs> to which I'll say, yeah, that's true, I guess. At any rate, in poems like I Think Its Name Was Lazarus, Dimitri allows us to lament the tub slash death sight of a drowned rodent. And yet, glimpses of humor emerge with the lines, the grave sight was rented, a two-ply mummification with slushy eyes still open. I mean, that's just gorgeous and so generous. We need to hear these words in our times. We need a heart like the one that extends in these stanzas, forgiving, because like, real talk, sometimes I'm like F politics. Can I live inside this man's nest of language, coop myself in his beard to brave the winter in America, hibernate through this F and hate, pick his stubble instead of the struggle of having to pronounce my name? See, Dimitri, I can rip off the song that is you. But in all seriousness, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I got mad love for you, papa, and I know you rock this stage. Please help me in welcoming our Newark native, Mr. Ain't Got No Beef, AKA the other hombre of the Rutgers MFA, excuse me, Rutgers Newark MFA. Sorry, Jana. Ayúdame en bienvenir, my dear, dear compa, Dimitri Reyes. Weekend, you're gonna make me cry, man. <laughs> All right. If anyone has ever lived in an apartment that is older than 50 years old, you know, no matter how many times you sweep that hardwood, it's always going to be dirty. <laughs> the roofs are leaking. We don't need AccuWeather to tell whether or not to fetch our ponchos. We'll know when we wake up to children gagging their version of plaster soup while we inconveniently wash our hands in beds. We could know by the heaps of gypsum caked on furniture and asphyxiating coats of wet condensation on our windows coming from the inside instead of outside. Neglect and duration brought back wartime feelings, wooden floors damp, our moist, our feet are sinking in their trenches like morning dew in jungles that exists nowhere because everywhere it's still pre-war. Buck-shaped cat toys. Its hairy legs bothered, their hairy tongues flitted like pistons in their mouths. 
It flailed forward and backward. It rocked, but couldn't flip itself upright. Even with the batting of the paws and the nails and the meows, claws retracted. Poor thing, for the death of it, the roach couldn't escape the life that beat inside my cats. I entered the kitchen to their banging exoskeleton drumming, and I yelled an indigenous phrase, or maybe Spanish. They skittered, but roach played possum on its back in hopes I didn't see it. That scared, I scared, everything was scared, its attackers, and not become one. That I would dismiss its presence, holding onto life to be able to continue peeing on my silverware, watching me from the wooden dampness inside the walls, so I placed it in a plastic blueberry container where a roach could find its way to four fours and antennae. It couldn't smile. But Roach was happy and I was happy because it couldn't physically touch it and hold it where I saw it in the yellow fluorescent light. In a stained container against stained walls, it was still alive when I set it free inside my apartment dumpster and now I was too. I think its name was Lazarus. This is what being human feels like. I picked it out of my drain. It was soft a clump of hair until I heard the crunch of its tiny bones. I dropped it, repulsed by a being who swallowed air like me. I thought about the lifelessness in my apartment, my cats playing with the dead. I thought of liquid balloon in the lungs. Its body was an Aquafina water bottle with a tail. I wondered how it got there, past the soap scum, hair, and lint, and semen, how it crawled up a second floor drain. I wondered if it tried to crawl away when its attraction to the light was revealed as a sealed metal grid. I thought about claustrophobia, the PVC pipe diameters, the two inches of panicking girth that backed my drain. I wonder how rodents and the many companions got there, the exterminators, asbestos, wired mesh, Rat poison sticky traps. None know its death. The grave site was rented. A two ply mummification with slushy eyes still open and it was flushable. Toilet paper wrapped around my hand and I still never drowned anyone. They died and they lived. I sat across a teenager eating a sulfuric sandwich and a woman in a Dunkin' Donuts uniform took a seat in my chair. The train started moving and smelled of breakfast eggs and coffee. It made me queasy. I was reading Martin Espada's El Morivi. On the next stop, a man came on board to greet her milky skin, and they were both tired. Another man not far behind stirred in a groggy morning and waved to him. He made his way to the pair that became disgruntled. Me and the five people on the train found out that both of these men knew the woman. An argument at 7 a.m. is always interesting. Everyone is tired of everyone. The men began speaking bitter coffee beans to each other, suddenly possessing loads of caffeine. An awkwardly aggressive volley of loaded phrases kept being exchanged between the three of them. What? 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 I remembered reading about worker strikes and personal revelation, the air smell of hazelnut, and their plot was brought to boil. Curses began to press together, coffee beans in a grinder. They yelled at each other, but the person to blame was she who brewed them. Two scalded cups of coffee, one was black, one was made with too much milk, an accident made generationally by the barista. I saw her name tag and it read imperialist infrastructure. The majority of drinkers liked their java light, so she blew her nose, called it creamer, and made them fight for it. They were yelling and waving their fists. They were taste testing to see whose presentation was better, what flavor was bolder. The most ridiculous display, one tall cup of Jamaica Blue Mountain yelling in slacks in a suitcase, the other bubbling machismo and bustelo on work boots and jeans. Others on the train lost their appetite. The teenager didn't sip his coffee anymore. He let his headphones take him somewhere. He didn't smell coffee grounds or cream. I continued to read and I swear these two cups grew fists and tasted blood that wasn't theirs. 
They felt the pain of the cotton gin piercing their palms. They felt scabbed dirt corroborating beneath their nails. They felt indentured servitude. They felt the bites of dogs. They felt cold hosings. They felt the crackings of clubs to skulls and respiratory cancer from Agent Orange and tomato fields and cancers from the crude oil of rigging and dermatitis from household chemicals and lung disease from gas station pumps and scoliosis from hard labor. They felt rebellion. They felt miseducation and they felt their mothers singing gospels and folk songs on their backs. I read El Morivi again and again. The actual fight only took seconds, but then I knew they grew tired again from the morning, from the love, from life, their steam expelled. This wasn't about fighting for Milk's attention anymore, but it's always a misunderstanding at 7 a.m. And the bystanders live, and I live, and the barista lives, and the fight kills something in them. There were two coffee cups set to boil, to grow fists, to swing them at no one but themselves. A tale from the terrarium. He grew from different gashes in concrete, always covered in dirt. No one named him, he's nondescript, he's evergreen. Weather never killed him. He was a sidewalk collector that sprouted immobile and cracked from dust on windy mornings. He thought standing still would draw others to his wilting. No one helps, but sometimes they fed him twiggy branches, scratched to pieces by bugs burrowing the broken bark, invasive eczema arms animated in surrender, and he hated them all. He was an angry preacher crying nectar. He couldn't bear the beating of his sermon where the sun showed him too clearly and screamed for his release. He continued to germinate on street corners, continued to starve on what didn't matter, flitting in the wind his epilepsy of body spliced between itself and the world that dropped him only once. That time that I tongued the ground with my teeth and mixed blood with dust, I cried and no one ever heard me because wallflowers talk so damn low. You left the neighborhood. You left the neighborhood, you left your friends, you left your parents, grandparents, siblings, aunts, uncles, you left the corner store, you left where you discovered gayness and cigarettes and pot and beer, you left the thoughts of how they all complimented each other like skipping school and pizza, you left the dirty mirror pics in the bathroom with the light on, with laughter, with the stained glass butterfly you made in a dusty summer, you left the mariposas strung up on the shower ganchos, you left memories of robbery that taught you what trust meant, what it felt like to have it taken from you. You left driveways where you'd ride scooters, friends in circles taking turns to see who catch who, the real catch. There would be no one to chase unless someone left first. So you left the various colored stoops. You left the side of the house that led you to church that showed you faith in anything. You left the other side that showed you the street, that showed you the cutting of cement skateboard wheels caught in cracks. The rocks split your knees. You left the pork chops and potatoes. You left learning that one inch rakes were not for show, that they broke pebbles and cultivated dead flowers that you called drug addicts. You left our saturated memories. Remember that time we were about to beat up Miguel's drunk dad? Or when dope head Eddie went luging down the hill in your skateboard? Remember when he never brought it back? Remember when I got high and fell off the roof running from the cops? We always laughed about my hospital to prison transfer. Remember how we weren't allowed upstairs that night? How everything smelled of burnt plastic and they blamed it on cheap incense? Remember that one of us finally made money on the streets and everyone helped me spend my money except you because you left the blood on the walls, our name signed with our punches. You left those people, those noises, the swings, the misses and hack people attempts to find ourselves. We were the tendons in your hand, and we, when we separated, you cried. You broke the wall so hard, the one we're still trying to climb. We left you before you left us, and you know it was better that way. We were your broken knuckles that kept you from making a fist, and we're so sorry that we're still left punching. Are you guys enjoying it? <laughs> Assessment of the urban dollar. This is the one that got me into the MFA program, I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks, guys. 
assessment of the urban dollar, paper currency, the dollar green ink on the dollar green paper that makes others without them green with envy. It's the difference between expensive but fresh produce or a value menu from McDonald's, a hamburger that costs factory cents to make, but shh, that's their secret. Says the man at the bus stop talking to his friend about him trading EBT credit for hard-earned dollars. Man prides himself on affording skirt steak. Put it on my card. Another man has his child starving empty in new Air Jordans. Clothes, technology, visuals, disposables, similar to a throwaway razor wielded by every suit man by Prudential and brought for a dollar as he sits next to me on the bus frantically trimming the hair around his white collar. He maintains his presentable appearance in an unpaid two-piece tender. Oh, crap, guys. Uh, he, he maintains his presentable appearance in an unpaid two-piece charge on tender, supporting the company that grants him access to better opportunity because of their newly mandated minority quota. The sign above the quasi-barber reads, where will your child be at 4 p.m.? An easy answer, of course buying an afternoon snack, an overpriced bag of chips and soda, everything they need to keep their motor running, bodies crashing, and my Medicaid paying. I conclude with the transit bell and step off the bus that so much depends on a dollar. If only I had a dollar. And this is the last one, and this is only by request. Um, I almost got away without reading a vegan poem, Allegra, but I just feel like doing it. <laughs> This is no laughing matter. In the chop shop, a hundred names. Family pack chicken legs. Family pack chicken thighs. 18 piece chicken fryer pack. Family pack boneless chicken breasts. Family pack leg quarters in a four pound bag. Contains up to 4% water. Oven roaster chicken. Oven broiler chicken. Thick and juicy. Whole chicken. Whole chicken halves. Cut up whole chickens. Chicken wings. Chicken thighs. Chicken leg quarters. Don't you taste that blood? Boneless, skinless chicken thighs. Boneless chicken breasts. Cube chicken breasts. Chicken split breasts. Would you like your breast split? Thin sliced chicken breasts. Chicken liver cups. Chicken gizzards, chicken tenders, chicken hearts, chicken bones, chicken backs, chicken feet, pig feet pickled, smoked pork feet, smoked pork neck bones, smoked pork hocks, pork hocks fresh, pig feet fresh, pork fat back, bone pork loin whole, boneless pork loin half, bone and pork chop thin cut, bone and pork chops regular, bone and pork chops thick, rib and pork chops, boneless pork chops thin, boneless pork chops regular, boneless pork chops thick cut, Pork shoulder boneless, pork spare ribs fresh, pork spare ribs frozen in plastic for two years, only two years, folks. Pork leg joint, pork belly, pork belly joint, baby back ribs frozen, baby back ribs smothered in sweet baby Ray's barbecue sauce. Lamb rack, lamb chunks, lamb chops, lamb flaps, lamb neck, lamb back strap. If you guys don't know what that is, that's a nerve. Lamb shoulder, whole turkey, turkey legs, turkey wings, turkey necks, turkey tails, turkey giblets, hearts, gizzards, livers, genitals. Ground turkey, ground chicken, ground pork, ground veal, ground beef 90% lean, 10% fat, they're hitting the gym. Ground beef 80% lean, 20% fat. Ground beef 23% lean, 27% fat if you nasty. Ground pork chop, ground pork veal, ground beef meatloaf mix, chuck steak, cube steak, hanger steak, that's your soul. Skirt steak, sandwich steak, beef chuck stew, beef chuck arm, beef sirloin chip, beef braziole, that's fancy, right? Beef chuck bone in, beef brisket thin, beef brisket thin, beef shoulder, beef short ribs, beef stir fry, beef stir steak. T-bone steak, London bro, rump roast, beef caps, beef knuckles, beef eye round, beef eel round, beef eyes, tripe, oxtails, lard, cow feet, cow tongue. That's my tongue. Good night, guys. <laughs>